chapter number 17, 1 Kings chapter number 17. There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible, and this is one of my favorite. Uh, I love the Bible, but there's just something about when you get to this point, when you're reading through your Bible, and you get to uh, chapter 17, where my heart just starts to flutter a little bit, because we're introduced to one of the most colorful characters in the scriptures, a single man by the name of Elijah. And we have a chapter here with, that features for us two single people. One is a prophet named Elijah, and the other is just a widow of Zarephath. We don't know her name. She's just called the widow of Zarephath. She doesn't want to be single, but her husband has died, and she's a widow. She appears to be a young widow because we are also introduced to a third character, her son, uh, who four times in this chapter is called a child. And so she's probably a young widow. That that happens sometimes back in Bible days. We have uh, such longevity, it seems, now in America that you don't hear about too many young widows uh, in our day and age or in our country, but, but certainly in the scriptures we do read about the young widows, and we even have a, a, a doctrinal text written to young widows in, in 1 Timothy chapter number uh, 5. But we have two singles' lives who just happen to collide by divine appointment. Uh, in this chapter, and the title of my message this morning is this, Two Singles, Four Miracles. Two Singles, Four uh, Miracles. If you are a Bible reader, and, and every one of us ought to be a Bible reader, uh, you can't help but notice eventually in your Bible reading that whenever you have a single person or a widow mentioned in the Bible, Either a miracle is about ready to happen or some great work for God is about ready to be done. And that's basically the whole message today on how God can use uh, single people and how God can use widows and how God can not only work through them but work for them. And we're going to see some miracles here today where God either works through single people or works for them and helps them. And I'm, I'm just hoping it's going to be a great encouragement uh, to those of you today that have come on what we call here at our church Singles uh, single Sunday. Whenever you study the singles of the Bible, either two things are going to happen, miracles or great works. Whether it's Hagar uh, back in Genesis 16, a, a single mother uh, who sent out to pasture with a bottle of water and God changes her little bottle of water to a whole well of water that would provide for her and her son and make of her son a great nation. Or single people like we see like Elijah today, or Elijah who would follow him, who would, who would literally leave his parents, walk away from his mom and dad, and, and, and follow Elijah and minister to him and then become the next great preacher. Elijah would ask for a double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah who he look at today, and, and it's interesting to note that in uh, Elijah's life, we have uh, cataloged for us in Scripture eight miracles in the Bible, and in Elijah's life, at least 16, and he did get a double portion. We talked earlier in the service about Daniel, but let's not forget his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, also uh, single men living in captivity and in Babylon. And what about Jeremiah, who was commanded by God not to take a wife, not to have any children, and how the Lord so profoundly used him? John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, the Ethiopian eunuch, and of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, you study single people in the Bible, and something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And uh, widows, uh, something's going to happen. Single mothers. Uh, something's going to happen. God is going to show his great care for them. God is going to show his power through them. As the Apostle Paul said in his writings in 1 Corinthians 7, he actually said, I wish you were all like me. I wish you could all be like me, single, and be able to attend upon the Lord without distraction and uh, live a life uh, completely devoted uh, to the Lord. But anyways, I want to get back to these two singles here, Elijah and uh, the widow of Zarephath, and just by divine appointment, 
we're going to see their lives uh, kind of have a collision course in the great, great things. I want you to notice four miracles now. Four miracles in 1 Kings chapter number 17 with me. And let's begin, and we see the very first one in the very first verse. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Wow, that's power. There's a single man with the power of God on his life. He just kind of appears. It's the first mention of his name is here in verse 1. We don't know much about him. We don't know about his family or anything. We're just Elijah the Tishbite. And if you study commentaries, most commentaries admit they don't know what the word Tishbite even means. Uh, he came out of somewhere. He was one of the inhabitants of Gilead. But he was living in the worst of days when the government was at its worst and society was at its worst. This should give us hope this morning. The king is Ahab. His wife is the infamous Jezebel. They are as evil as government as could possibly get uh, on earth. They are holy. The whole nation has turned its back on God and have wholly given themselves over to the worship of Baal, except for 7,000. A small remnant of 7,000 Jews who would not bow to the, to the image of Baal, nor kiss him. But the rest, in fact, uh, Elijah would late, later take on about 850 of the prophets and priests of Baal up on Mount Carmel. There were so many of them. And there was only a few prophets left, about 100 that were hiding in caves and about 7,000 uh, citizens of that country that wouldn't bow to Baal, but the other millions had just given themselves holy, and, and Ahab the Bible says, just sold himself to do wickedness. You know, God's power and God's work through a single person is not affected by how bad the government is or who's in office. Amen? Doesn't affect God at all. It doesn't affect God how bad the country has become. If a young man will just seek to have the power of God upon his life, God can use that man. In the worst of days, when the nation is at its worst. Does that sound familiar? Maybe that can give us some hope today in our country. That if we can find some young and married people, God uses married people too. We're just trying to focus on singles. But I'm here to say to you this morning, don't let the things that are happening today in Washington, D.C., and Albany uh, uh, affect your opinion of God. And what God can do through you. And just yield your life to, to the Lord. Now, I'd like you to turn over to James chapter 5 and verse 7. But notice here, Elijah stood before the king. He said to the king that, look, there's not going to be any dew nor rain these years. But according to my word. Wow, that is faith in action right there. Now, we have a greater insight into this man, Elijah, later in the New Testament. Keep your place here. We'll come right back. But James gives us a little bit of insight into him we don't see in the book of 1 Kings. When he says this in verse 17, Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. Sometimes we look at these Bible characters as superheroes uh, that are so amazing they don't even need to go to the bathroom. You know, we get these pictures of like Superman and Batman and all this other delusion we fill our minds up with and we think boy these people don't even have to clear their throat or go to the bathroom we, we start thinking about bible characters that way but God is very careful by the Holy Spirit through James to tell us that Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are I remember Paul and Silas uh, when they were there on the Isle of um, uh, Melita uh, and uh, they started uh, doing miracles, and they started worshiping Paul and Silas. Was it Paul and Silas? I don't remember, but they started worshiping him, and uh, they started making garlands for him and, and, and everything, and, and Paul and Silas ran and said, no, 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 no. We said, they said, we're men of like passions as you are. 
See, these are not superheroes. These are men who have to deal with their flesh. They have to deal with the world. They have to uh, deal with uh, uh, the, the devil. They had all kinds of opposition, just like you and I. Elijah was a man subject to like passions. But here's what made the difference in this single man that often is missing for some, from some others. In verse 17, it says these three words, and he prayed. There's the difference. When somebody starts praying, they're going to start making a difference. But notice how he prayed, and he prayed earnestly. And he prayed earnestly. He got along with God, and he said, Dear God, you've got to do something for my nation. We have a wicked government. We have a wicked society. We have wicked priests and prophets that have turned their backs on thee, and they're worshiping Baal. And, and dear God, if you can use me, I pray that you would do something. He started praying, and he started praying earnestly. And I want to encourage all of you to attend prayer meetings. Get into prayer meetings. Start praying for America. Start praying for New York. Start praying for Evans and start praying for Eden and the surrounding area because it just seems like our country has made a wholesale departure from God. And we need, we need some single people, some single men, some single women who will rise up and, and show this generation that their God is still alive. But it's going to take some single men who are going to pray earnestly. We're going to pray. That's the only difference between Elijah. He had like passions. He was tempted just like all you other men. And this is the bad season, isn't it? The Bible says about that demoniac of Gadara over there in Mark chapter 8, I think it is. It says he was full of the devils and he wore no clothes. Sounds like America must be full of the devils because there's hardly anybody wearing clothes anymore. And Elijah was a man of like passions, but he said, you know something, my life's going to count. My life's going to, maybe the other single men of my day won't, but Elijah prayed earnestly, and it says here in verse 17 what happened. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months, and he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I mean, here's one guy affecting his whole nation, one man. One man affecting his whole nation because he prayed earnestly. He said, I'm going to show people my God's still alive. I don't care what they do. Everybody else can join the crowd, but I'm going to stay alone. Walk with God and pray earnestly. And when you get back to 1 Kings, it not only didn't rain. Verse 1 says they didn't even have dew on the ground. Now, brethren, when it says he leadeth me besides still waters, I never knew this. So I was studying it recently. The word still waters means the dew on the grass. Did you know there's animals like gazelles and sheep and others that if they go out while the dew's on the grass in the morning and they'll go out while the dew's on the grass in the evening and they'll eat the grass. They'll eat what God provides them, the green pastures, amen? They don't have to take a drink of water in months. That's what it means when he says he leads me beside the still waters. They don't have to drink in months. They'll get enough water, distilled water. The cleanest water on earth is the dew every morning and every night. And you get in the word of God every day, the green pastures. And you get in the word of God every night of your life, and it will satisfy your thirst, and it will strengthen you. It'll strengthen you. But here there's no dew, man. This is serious business. There's no dew and there's no rain. I want you to notice the first miracle, the rain restrained. The rain restrained. Now let's notice the second miracle that God does for Elijah, and this is the ravens. Number two is the ravens. And the word of the Lord came unto him, verse 2, saying, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh 
in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening and he drank of the brook and it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because he had there had been no rain in the land I want you to notice the second miracle now is the ravens the ravens are an unclean bird the ravens are carnivorous they eat flesh what did they carry in their mouths flesh this is a divine supernatural miracle that has no explanation except this God can do anything and I want to encourage all of the singles that are here today to remember, doesn't matter if you're single, uh, 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 divorced, widowed, or whatever, God's got it all covered in the Bible. God can do anything for you. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. Now, how long was there no rain on the land? Three and a half years, according to James 5, verses 17 and 18. How long did God feed Elijah with ravens? We don't know. But let's say it was most of that time. God said, I want you to go by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And he says, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. This is the first of three times where God is going to supernaturally provide for Elijah. The first is by ravens. He said, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. And the Bible says every single morning some ravens came with bread in their mouths. Other ravens came with flesh in their mouths. And I can't imagine being those ravens. You know, a raven is a, a, you know, a noun. It's a bird. But did you ever look up the word raven as a verb? What does it mean? It means to devour the raven, the prey, uh, they're, they're carnivorous. And, I, and somehow God changed the very nature of these ravens so that the flesh they were dying to eat, they didn't eat it, they carried it to Elijah. And Elijah said, thank you, see you tonight. And if it was for three years, I don't know how long God did this, but if it was for three years, those ravens made over 2,000 trips to bring him bread and flesh. That's a miracle. That's what God can do through a single man, the first miracle, the rain restrained, and for a single man, the ravens. You know, you don't have, this is something that can help. You don't have to go through life with all your dependence and faith and confidence and trust in your paycheck. God is greater than your paycheck. And you don't have to guide your life by what kind of a job or a paycheck you can get and, and, and so oftentimes step right out of the will of God because this pays more money. There is a God in heaven who cares about single people and it was greater than our paychecks. And there are times when occasionally somebody will rise up in a generation and trust in that God, and God will show him great, himself great on their behalf. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And boy, we need some men like this today. We need some women like this today who will trust in God. You cannot serve God and mammon, and I fear some of you are, are maybe starting to swerve from God's will for your life because you're, you're trying to evaluate everything in dollars and cents. I've got bills to pay and, 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 and places to go and things to do and so on and so forth, and man alive, Jesus come along one day and said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Brethren, if God can take an unclean bird, like a raven, and take care of his servant, he's the same God today. 
And we have to make sure we do not limit God in some kind of a box on what he can do for us. I want you to notice the third miracle. The third miracle now is the refilling. We now have the widow, another single character added to our chapter in verse number 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. And by the way, that's where Jezebel came from. That's like her hometown. Who in the world would want to go there? It's the last place you'd want to go. This lady's trying to kill me. She hates me. Jezebel was trying to, she was after Elijah. And God says, I go up by her hometown there, and notice what he says, I have commanded. I have commanded. What did he say back in verse 4? I have commanded the ravens to feed thee. And now he says here in verse 9, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. Now, she didn't get the memo. She didn't know this, but God knew what he was doing. He said, I want you to go up there by the Mediterranean Sea near, near Tyre and Sidon, and, and, and there's a widow up there, and uh, the brooks dried up here, Brook Cherith, and, and the ravens, were, I'm going to give them a break. But you go up there, there's a widow. I've commanded her to sustain thee. And so I'm sure as Elijah is making the trip up there, uh, maybe 50 miles, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's about 50 from, the, from over by the Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea, 50 miles. It's a real skinny nation. He's going there saying, <laughs> man, great, a widow. She's probably got a good inheritance or maybe her husband had good life insurance. This, this lady's loaded. He gets there, she's got two sticks, a handful of meal, and a little bit of oil in a cruise. God says, uh, go, go, go by her. She's going to take care of you. And, and by the way, she's got a son too. She's got to take care of him. <laughs> Sounds like a miracle waiting to happen. You know, I mean, you, what if you had a prophet show up and you're a widow with a son? And when he arrives, you're taking your two sticks. You're going to build a little fire, make your last little bread, whatever, biscuit, uh, with your flour and oil and eat it and then die. And then he comes along and says, uh, hey, uh, could you get me something to drink? And, uh, well, water was a little bit more plentiful over there. That's no problem. And then he says, by the way, could you uh, fix me something to eat too? And she says, look. She says, it's just me and my son. I got one little biscuit here left, all right? He says, don't worry about it. God's told me he's going to take care of you. He said, what do you have in the house? And she said, a handful of meal and a little bit of oil. And he says this to her. He says, you give it to God. You give God everything. You hold back nothing. You give it to God, and he'll take care of you. And all through the Bible, we see examples where when somebody finally gives something all to God, God comes to their aid and takes care of them. And I want to encourage you young people, give yourselves to God completely. Hold nothing back. Just take everything you've got and just give it to the Lord. Say, here it is, Lord. It's not much. Maybe it's a little lad with a lunch. Or a little widow with two mites or something. But you give to God what you've got. And the Lord will take that and he'll multiply that. He'll multiply that. And I want you to notice that as we read the story beginning at verse 8. It says, Arise, verse 9, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. And he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks and he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as, he was going to fetch, as she was going to fetch it, he called on her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress them for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth, and she did 
according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. I cannot tell you how important obedience is to the revealed will of God. Elijah obeyed. He went to Zarephath, where God told him to go, and found this widow. And then the widow obeyed, even though what he seemed to be saying to her was absolutely impossible and almost heartless. And brethren, there are times when God is going to ask us to do things that do not make any sense whatsoever. To test our faith, to test our trust, to test our confidence in the Lord. And she obeys the man of God. And she went, verse 15, and did according to the saying of Elijah. And because she obeyed the man of God and followed God's word, and because Elijah got, followed God's word, look, whenever anybody follows God's word, God gets in on that. And God begins to help even widows, even widows who have absolutely nothing, who have no prospects for the future, who have no money in an account somewhere, nothing in escrow, no life insurance. A widow has nothing, but, but she could do one thing. She could obey the Lord and trust in the Lord, and all the necessary food was then supplied to her by God miraculously until the rain began to fall upon the earth again. And that household just had a feast every day while everybody else had a famine. What's the difference? Again, we can see what God can do for single people. Single people who will trust. Single people who will listen to the instructions of God and obey them, even if they don't seem to make any sense. I don't know about you, but I remember, I remember the first time I heard the concept of tithing. I, I can remember that. The preacher preached on tithing from the Bible. I thought, this guy's a, a charlatan. Man, what is he talking about? Giving 10% of, of everything I have, the first fruits to God? Is he out of his mind? I need money. Uh, I don't need to give it away. I need it. Uh, he doesn't understand. And so I continued to flounder around in failure financially. But finally, you know, you, I don't know if this process takes place in your life, but it does in mine. First, you get mad when you hear something like that. Then you get sad because you realize it's right and you're not doing it. Then you start doing it and you get glad. Amen. And so my, in the worst stage of my life, I started giving tithes to the Lord and offerings what, what I could. My wife did too. And man, all of a sudden that thing started working. And, and, and we found out we could live on 90% of our income with God's blessing a whole lot more than we could live on 100% of our income with God's curse. Wow, he can do stuff like this. He can make sure your, wheat, your, your, your meal never fails and your cruise is always full. When everybody else is saying, wow, a recession's killing me. And you scratch your head and say, what recession? I must have missed that. My God wasn't affected by that, amen? The refilling, the refilling of the meal and the oil. And then finally, I want you to notice the resurrection. The resurrection, the fourth miracle. After the famine's over and God blesses and Elijah prays earnestly and the rains come and the earth begins to produce and, and uh, uh, the natural laws take effect and we, they begin to be supplied by God's natural laws, amen. One way or another, all good things come from the Lord. But verse 17, we have our final miracle this morning. It says, and it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him, and he did die. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, 
Hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let the child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. There's power in prayer. There's power when single people pray. Now listen, single people, there's going to come times in your life where you're not going to understand what God's doing. I want you to notice the widow and Elijah had no clue what was going on. The widow expressed her bitterness. What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Verse 18, art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Notice her misconception or misperception of God. She thought, boy, God's finally caught up with me. God's punishing me for something I did in my past. She did something in her past. I don't know what it was. She said, well, you know, I, I feel so, so sorry for people that live this way. They always think they're being punished. Every time something goes wrong, God's punishing me. God's punishing me. God's punishing me. God's punishing me. Man, I, I want to encourage you to, to, to meet and know the God of the Bible. Yeah, he chastens his children, but he does it in love. And he is a God who has promised that he would forget our pasts and remember them no more. Now, I know there's consequences. Don't confuse consequences with condemnation. They're two different things. There are consequences for our decisions in, in the past, but not condemnation. Remember what Nathan said to David when he committed adultery with Bathsheba? She, he, com he confessed his crime, and, and what, what did Nathan say? First thing he said to David, the Lord hath put away thy sin. The Lord's put away your sin. You never have to bring it up again. But there's going to be consequences for your decision, and you have to face some consequences. This lady here had a single single widow had a misconception she said she said why why would God do this why would God give us all that meal and all that oil and, and keep my son alive all those days and now kill him I wouldn't God it says the kid fell sick and died of that sickness but it was so God could do a greater miracle and by the end, it says in verse 24, And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. See, God leads us through our seasons, and God leads us through our temptings and our trials and our testings, so that when we go through them, the trial of our faith, at the end we'll believe in him even more. And we'll believe in his prophets even more. That's why. That's why you're going through something today that... We, we don't have all the answers. Preachers don't have all the answers. Notice what the, the, the preacher says here in verse 20. He cried, O Lord, hast thou brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Elijah don't know what's going on either. There's times you can't go to the pastor. There's times you can't go to the elder and get a good answer. There's times all you can do is trust in the Lord. That's all you can do is trust in the Lord. And realize there's no person on earth that can answer why you're going through what you're going through. But if you, the, the, the key, the key is, is don't get bitter. Don't get bitter during those times. And, and he doesn't know what to do, so he does the one thing he knows he can do. And what's that? Pray. Give me your son. Give me your son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up in a loft and and laid him on his own bed, and he cried unto the Lord. Praise God for praying people. Praise God for single men who just take everything they face in life, and the first, the first thought they come and that comes into their mind is, I, I, I need to pray about this. This is bigger than us. If we don't get God's help on this, we're not going to get through this. We need God. We need God, this boy's dead. And he stretched himself. I don't know what that means. But over in 2 Kings 4 and verse 34, Elijah also saw a boy raised from the dead. 
and he stretched himself upon the boy. And Elijah stretches himself here uh, upon the child three times and cried to the Lord. He's, he's, he's praying without ceasing, O Lord, my God, I pray thee. And notice the specific prayer. Let this child's soul come into him again. This boy is dead. His soul has left his body. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Man, you talk about an awakening. This boy is raised from the dead, the resurrection, the fourth miracle of this chapter. Why? Because there's a single man who believes in God, believes in prayer and stretches himself. You know, when you look at the story of Elijah and Elijah working with the children of their day, it says they both stretched themselves. Brethren, I believe we're living a day and age in America when we're up against it in this fight for the children. There has never been a generation of children more distracted from God than this generation. And we're going to have to find some men of God who are going to start stretching themselves for the kids. We're going to have to start stretching ourselves. Reaching kids isn't going to be easy in this day and age. The kids are dead. The kids are dead in their trespasses and sins. And somebody's going to have to start praying for them. Somebody's going to have to start stretching themselves. Someone's going to help, have to help John over here and Denise. They, they can't do this alone in the bus ministry. We're going to need more workers in junior church, and we're going to need more workers in patch clubs and Sunday school. And we're going to need teachers who are, who are going to stretch themselves all week long and say, Oh, God. Oh, God, during that little half hour I have these kids, I pray. God, give me power. Give me power, Lord. These kids are lost today. Vacation Bible school is coming up. We got fasting day next Wednesday, uh, Monday. We're going to have to go without some food. We're going to have to suffer. We're going to have to say, God, bring these kids in from the community. Bring them in, Lord. Save them while they're here. Open their hearts. We've got to get some single people stretching themselves for the kids of their day. And he prays and he stretches himself. He puts his all into it. It says, and the child revived. And he took the child and brought him down out of the chamber of the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, see, thy son liveth. That's got that to be the best news she ever heard. Your son's alive. All glory to God. And then she said, she declared her faith. Now by this I know. Thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thee is of truth. I think the greatest mission field in our country is the children. It's hard to get them in the church these days. It's hard to get them on a bus. It's hard to find parents who have an ounce of concern enough for them. They got them in everything, every sport, every organization in town except church. You single people, you're not single so you can go to the party. You're not single so you can drink and have a good time and flirt with this boy and flirt with this girl and so on and so forth. You're single so you can attend unto the Lord without distraction and have the mighty power of God work on your life through these single people I've mentioned in the Bible this morning and not to waste that season of your life. Don't waste this season of your life. What's this all about? What's this got to do with me as single in church this morning? This chapter has everything to do with you. Because this chapter shows us what God can do for single people and through single people. We'll trust in him and pray. I'd like us to bow our heads and close our eyes. Have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you, dear Lord, that these stories in the Bible are not just so we can go ooh, ah, and look at him like he was some superhuman. He was a man subject to passions like as we are. In fact, we see fear get the best of him in a few chapters when he runs from, from Jezebel for his life. And he was just clay. He was just dirt. But he prayed. And during the time when the government and society was the worst it had ever been in its history, 
You lifted him up as a man of faith and a man of prayer, and you did miracles that caused the whole nation to consider the God of Israel. And Lord, I want to pray today in Jesus' name that you'd give us some young men, young ladies who aren't married, who will have a different spirit about them than the other the others of their day and age. And Lord, some of the older single people, that they maybe could be the next Daniel in a lion's den at 83 years of age. He says, I don't care what the government says, I'm going to keep praying towards Jerusalem. Throw me in a lion's den, I could care less. And oh, how we, we talk about that man to this day. We talk about him to this day, what a great man he was. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for Elijah. Thank you for the widow. Thank you when they were pressed by circumstances, famines, and death beyond probably what anybody in this room has ever been pressed. They prayed and they obeyed God. Help us to be like that and to see what you can do through us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like us to close the service by turning to page 5.